Welcome to my sewing room. We have such an exciting show for you today. You, I bet some of you thought there was nothing new under the sun as far as lace shaping went. Well, we were all wrong. We have pinless lace shaping now, and I'm going to share some really exciting things with you in just a few minutes. I want to tell you that heirloom sewing does not have to be just for little girls. It is absolutely beautiful. This is a very tailored little boy outfit with straight lace, a wonderful uh, handkerchief linen pants. And you know, I'm gonna turn this around just so you can see the back with a pretty little sailor collar. This is a little sailor suit for little boys. Now, what we're gonna do today we're going to do pinless lace circles. And I thought I would share with you, well, now these aren't really lace circles. This is a pinless lace oval with a Beverly Sheldrick design that is in our three best friends uh, doll book because this is a doll blanket and a doll quilt. And you see this lace oval right here? Well, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you how to do this totally the pinless method. Here is another dress with circular lace shaping, which you could do in the pinless. The Jack and Jill book has so many pretty dresses. This one has the curved lace. This can also be done pinless. Come down and look at this skirt and see these pretty waves on this skirt. I'm going to share with you how easy it is. And by the way, when you do pinless lace shaping, it makes it a lot faster. Do you love precious baby day gowns? Well, so do I. And this one is a very tailored christening dress. And it's very, very simple. A very, almost a Williamsburg look. It has the machine embroidered cross. And for those of you of the Christian faith, you might recognize the three intertwined circles for the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. A very simple christening dress. And another adorable little girl dress for precious little girls. And it has a little machine embroidered at the top. And once again at the bottom, we have machine circles. And we can do those the pinning old-fashioned way. But we have new excitement for you. We're going to do this the pinless circle way. Now, for something brand new, come on over with me to the technique boards. Let's see just how easy it is to make pinless lace circles. As in any lace shaping, you're going to need to trace your design onto your fabric and we're going to need a piece of insertion, French lace insertion. Now, in order to make a pinless lace circle, we're going to come around and simply hold it and stitch right along. I don't do any pinning. I will tell you though, I do have stabilizer underneath here. Then I'll come around on the circle and then as I'm traveling around teaching, people say, now Martha, what do we do on that area right there? And I'm going to show you what you do. You're going to come in here and fold under the tail that comes this way. You fold it under. And some of you might be thinking, but wait a minute, Martha, that's sort of floppy around there. We, you know what we do when we have lace that's, that's still not flat against the fabric. I pull the gathering thread on the this side of the lace circle, and it lays down perfectly. Now, to make this part of the lace lay down perfectly, I'm going to pull the gathering thread on this side of the circle. The reason I do not just grab one gathering thread and pull it all the way around is I might pull my gathering thread out. Now, I have folded under this lace tail, folding it up here. I have pulled the gathering threads. It's now time to come back and do a big zigzag around the outside, a zigzag around the inside, and I'm now ready to cut away the fabric from behind the lace. As you can see, I've done it on this side and I have my fold under. And what else I did on that fold under? After cutting the fabric from behind the lace circle, I went back and zigzagged over my fold under. This is what the lace circle looks like after you have all of the uh, fabric cut away from behind, and you went back and zigzagged over the miter, and also it's done in ecru thread on the ecru fabric. Now, would you come along with me and let me just kind of show you a little bit of this in live action over here at the sewing machine. First, I thought I just really wanted us to look at this beautiful little dress again that has the lace circles and then it has the scallops. And I just love this robin egg fabric, robin's egg blue fabric with the robin's egg blue bows and these beautiful little flower bouquets in here with a little yellow butterfly. This to me looks just like a little spring dress for a little, a little precious girl. 
Now, let's have some fun with this circular lace. I'd like to re re review one more time. I've stitched part of it here. I'm going to come around and stitch just the outside edge. Then when I come in the center, do you remember what I said I was going to do? You sure you do. I fold this piece under and mash it down. Then I'm going to pull the threads, the built-in gathering threads on both sides. See, I pulled the thread over. I will pull the thread over here and it lays down just perfectly. And I'm going to pull the thread over here and it lays down just perfectly. Go ahead and pull them. See, all you do is just pull it, it lays down. I have turned under the tail of the lace right here on this very edge. I'm going to lay it up, fold it up, and now I'm ready to zigzag the outside or else pin stitch or else wing needle entredo stitch. Pin stitch or zigzag the outside, zigzag the inside, and then I will cut the fabric from behind the lace circle. After cutting the fabric from behind the lace, I will go back and zigzag over the miter, and that is absolutely, those are the steps. Now, let's just go ahead and do this. Let's go ahead and do the uh, pinless lace shaping. I am using a pin stitch and a large needle, not a wing needle, but a large needle. As you can see, I'm just simply holding the lace, stitching just a little bit at a time, I'm doing my pinless lace shaping. I'm not holding, I'm not, I don't have anything pinned at all. I'm just putting the straight lace on the outside. Let me flatten it out just a little bit here. I do have a stabilizer underneath. And I did use a, a temporary spray adhesive to secure the stabilizer to the fabric. It just makes it a little bit easier to work with. I'm simply, I'm using a Madeira applique stitch is what I'm using here with just a large needle. It makes such a pretty stitch and really, people, it is not hard to do. Pin this lace shape and you just hang on to it and travel. And you can just do a little zigzag for the first, for going around the first time, you can just do a little bit of a zigzag. And that is absolutely all there is to pinless lace shaping. Let me show you one more place that you can use the circular. We did a little circle on the sleeve of this dress and it makes a really pretty sleeve. It looks like the top of the sleeve is white and the bottom is robin's egg blue, but that really was another little circle that was done on the sleeve of this pretty little dress. And now I have a doll dress for you. I think you will really like this lace and tux nightgown that we have for Cecil Elizabeth and other 18 inch dolls. Absolutely wonderful are the tucks. I'm going to show you in a minute how to make these little folded tucks. They're really very easy to do. The sleeve on Cecil's nightgown, the pretty little long sleeve, just as pretty as the dress. As a matter of fact, it's just like the dress. It has three tucks and then a piece of insertion, three tucks, and then the elastic and then a little gathered lace around the bottom of the sleeve. The skirt on this dress is perfectly magnificent and I know I've talked to a lot of people around the country that say, Martha, I just want reasonably simple things on the fancy band of my daughter or my granddaughter's dress or for a christening or a communion dress. And the three little tucks, a little piece of insertion, the three little tucks, and then down here, three little tucks. And one of the things I'm going to share with you is how you turn up that double hem where it is hidden behind one of the little tucks. I think that makes a very, very nice hem. And I think you'll be very happy to know how easy it is to finish off the bottom of this magnificent little dress. And by the way, this dress is made out of a Swiss batiste, but you could use almost any type of batiste. It does not have to be a Swiss batiste fabric, but I always use French laces. Now, I have several techniques needs to share with you on this little nightgown. I would first like to review with you, how, for those of you that might not know, how do you make a folded tuck? You possibly can see here that I have three lines drawn off up here. There's going to be, there are going to be three more tucks up here. I have one, two, three lines drawn off. Now some people tell you, well, you go in here and you pull a thread and then you fold it along the thread line. Well, that probably is the proper way of doing it, but I usually don't pull threads. I'll be honest with you. I probably don't have time to do that. So I trace very carefully my fold lines. Then to make a folded tuck, you simply pick it up and I've tried to finger press this a little bit in advance for you. You pick it up, 
fold it, and then you use your quarter inch guideline, whatever that may be, and do a quarter inch seam right alongside there after we picked it up. And that is the way I make my folded tucks. Okay, the next technique I would like to share with you is sort of a beginning French sewing by machine technique. So I have the lace pinned right in between those two rows of one, two, three tucks, one, two, three tucks. So I simply pin my lace in between and I really do like to use a stabilizer when I'm going to do a pin stitch as I am now. So I put a little bit of the spray on temporary spray adhesive staple, uh, spray on my stabilizer to hold my fabric to that. And now then I'm going to come in here and do one of my favorite stitches, which is a pin stitch or a Madeira applique stitch. Always take your pins out, of course. This is one of the most beautiful stitches for heirloom sewing. The Madeira applique, the name the Madeira applique, comes from the Madeira Islands off the coast of Portugal. And it was originally used on tablecloths and wonderful linens that were made in Portugal. It is so wonderful that our modern sewing machines have the Madeira applique, or the pin stitch is another word for the Madeira applique stitch. I am not using a wing needle to attach this beautiful lace. I am using a large needle. I think it is a 100, but it may be a 110. I simply pull my pins out and travel right along. Okay, now that is my uh, pin stitch to attach my lace. The next thing I'm going to share with you is how do I sew this double hem in underneath that pin tuck? Well, it's just exactly like it sounds. I go back to a straight stitch. I raise up one side of that pin tuck. Just fold it back. Well, it really isn't a pin tuck. It's a folded tuck. I raise up one side. I fold it back and simply straight stitch right along. Straight stitch right I'm sorry, I didn't get a straight stitch. But anyway, I straight stitch right along the inside of that pin tuck. And then I fold the tuck right down right down where it was, and I have a hidden seam and a very beautiful seam. And you know what I would like to share with you? We talked about the temporary spray adhesive. There are so many notions that have been developed in our wonderful sewing industry. It almost seems like every year we have fabulous new products, sometimes coming from other industries, sometimes just being developed for the sewing industry. I'd like to share with you one of these clever notions, and this particular segment was filmed at a consumer show in Arlington, Texas. A big problem when you're sewing is sewing on pile fabrics, or velvet definitely, because velvet has those little fibers that scooch back and forth, and you end up with shifting and pooches and all sorts of aggravation. But I have stitched this entire seam, believe it or not, without a single pin, without a single basting thread, by stitching it with this velvet V foot that has this ridge on the bottom. This one fits a snap-on machine and this fits a low shank machine. So think about a sailboat. There's keel is in the water, the boat's floating on top of the water. That's the premise behind this foot. So whichever one you are using, that point or ridge is the only point that is affecting or in the fabric. The foot itself is floating on top of the fabric. Therefore, there's no possibility of shifting of the fibers. And therefore, you sew a seam, and this is what's used in the industry. It's now just become available for the public. And it's a wonderful lifesaver when you're stitching, particularly those Christmas velvet dresses and so on and so forth. This, you will stitch it, and then you will press it. Now, you'll notice that I've stitched it, and I don't end up with what I call on the right side are railroad tracks or ridges that usually occur when you're using a traditional presser foot that's pressing right along here and you end up with those railroad tracks or ridges. To press the seam, I use the industrial needle board that comes from the industry where they cover their entire pressing surface with this surface. It looks like, honestly, the pokey side of Velcro, but it works and you will place your fabric right side down on here. Any pile fabric, whether it is the velvet or a knit fabric, you would put it on here and press it. 
it is flexible so that it will go over or bend over, shape over a seam roll. So now I'm pressing just the seam, never again leaving ridgy seam edge marks on my fabric. So it's a perfect solution for sewing on velvet. I am pleased to have as my guest today, Kathy Neal. Kathy is a very accomplished needle artist, and one of the most exciting things that she's doing now, she is enrolled in the certificated course at the Royal School of Needlework in London. Kathy, thank you for coming to be on the show. Oh, it's always a pleasure <laughs> to be with you, Martha. Today, I would like to talk about one of the most cherished of all embroidery stitches, and that's the feather stitch. My grandmother called it the briar stitch. Um, and my great-grandmother even called it the chicken scratching stitch. <laughs> I've, heard all, I've heard both of those. But um, it's a basic variation of the fly stitch. And I wanted to start today by talking a little bit about embroidery needles. As you see here from my collection, I have quite a few needles in all of these little tubes. I feel that embroiderers who limit the number of needles that they use and the sizes and the styles really limit their possibilities. Today I'm using a 10 sharp needle. It has a medium length shaft, a very sharp point, and a small round eye. It's perfect for many types of embroidery and one that they use quite a bit at the Royal School too. To begin the feather stitch, we first must have a design line and I've drawn that on my fabric here you see with an air erasable marker. To begin the stitch, um, what I like to do is do what I call darning in, and of course this line will be covered up with stitching. So what I do is I just take a few stitches, a few short stitches, and I leave the little knot right there on top. And what I want to do is come toward the end of my design line. And you'll notice that the, the fabric in my hoop is very loose right now, and I want it to be that way. And once I've darned in, then I begin, and using this line as my, as my guide, I come right up at the very end of the design line, and I make a loop below the needle with my thread, just so. And the first stitch comes across horizontally and angles back to the design line, just like that. And when I pull it down, you see it forms a little horseshoe. Now notice I didn't come quite all the way back to the design line. That will keep the stitches nice and curved. If you want them more angled, then you can come all the way back to the design line. On the next stitch, I still make a loop of thread down under the needle, but this time I come on the opposite side of the design line, and I want to make sure that that stitch starts right at the bottom of the curve that was formed by the previous one. And I come across and come almost to the design line. And I keep going in this manner. Now at this point, once we've got a couple of stitches done, we can reach right up there and snip off that little knot. And that is in there securely. So now you just go right to left, alternating side to side with your feather stitch nicely and evenly. And by trying to keep your stitches the same size, coming out from the design line the same amount every time and angling down, you start to get a very nice, beautiful little feather stitch, just like that. And as I say, it's quite a wonderful decoration. This is a wonderful stitch to use for foliage or for branches that you add flowers to. As far as using this stitch, it has a multitude of uses. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite on baby clothes here. You'll notice that I've used it to accentuate. If you have beautiful curves like the scallop of this bonnet, you can accentuate those by doing a decorative um, row of this feather stitching along that, and it really accentuates those beautiful design lines. And of course, one of my all-time favorite tricks is Martha. Sometimes I get a little lazy, and on this particular kimono, 
Um, I've actually used the feather stitch to trace in a wonderful little Peter Pan collar design. It's not really there, and then added a little trim. And if you did, you'd have to look twice to see that it really was a stitch instead of a collar, and of course used it other places as well. Oh, Kathy, thank you so much. And the feather stitch is truly one of my favorite stitches. And I really like your feather stitch fake Peter Pan collar <laughs> on this elegant kimono you've made for our viewers. Thanks. Kathy, thank you so much for thank being you, here. Martha. It's always a pleasure. And now I have a home decorating project for you. This is one of the most fun ideas we've ever had on the show. This is an antique handkerchief pillow. I know you've probably been to antique stores and just seen these wonderful handkerchiefs, oh, probably 1930s to 1950s. Anyway, we have a handkerchief just simply stitched on the top of a pillow, and we have rickrack around the edge, and let me say this, I was at a very expensive store in Europe recently, and these antique hanky uh, pillows were done in pale pink and pale blue, and they had machine embroidered baby right in the middle, and they were around $100. This did not cost $100. Okay, take any antique hanky that you have, come in where you don't have the scallops, just come in and stitch a square in the middle. We used red thread on this blue antique hanky. Then get your background fabric, and we put rickrack all the way around the edge, stitch down with red, and you do have to make your sewing lines. You need to mark the sewing line over here too. I'm going to pull on the backing of the pillow. Okay, right sides to right sides might be a good idea. I'm going to put this, uh, line it up, pin it a few places, and I already have my stitching line for the outside of the pillow because that will be the same as my rickrack line, and then I have another stitching line on the inside to kind of make a little outside edge of the pillow. And this, to me, is one of the most interesting ways to use some of those antique hankies. And I bet if you look around in your stash, which of course we prefer to call a resource center, you might find a few of these and maybe have a wonderful pillow for very little cost and a whole lot of fun. And that kind of a pillow is great for a gift, too. Now won't you come along with me to my attic? <music> On a recent trip to Portobello Road in London, I purchased this nightgown, which I think is the most beautiful nightgown I've ever seen in my life. The lace, the bodice is mitered and it's made out of beautiful lace insertion and beading. Since we learned how to do the pinless circles on this show, I wanted to share this particular circle. This is a piece of embroidery, a circular piece of embroidery. And do you notice the little, the little pink rose? It's a little handmade rose with green leaves. I purchased several pieces of this bridal trousseau, and that was on every one of them. Now, the, the bodice is so pretty. This little panel that hangs down the front has hand embroidery and several pieces of lace. And then the angel sleeves that go up over the sleeves on the gown are really pretty, too, with lots of hand pin stitch. But what I think is the most unusual feature of this nightgown is the sleeves. It has a pretty little short puff sleeve. And then two rows of beading, one row of insertion, and then this beautiful cuff that hangs down. Let me hold that up for you to see. It is a square of fabric embroidered all the way around. Really, it looks like a handkerchief, and it might even have been. But it's a square of fabric embroidered all the way around, and a circle has been cut out of the middle so it can be attached to that sleeve, and I have never seen anything quite that unusual, and it is so pretty. When you put this on, it is so pretty because it hangs down so pretty. Now, real quickly, let me turn this around to the back so I can show you that the back is exactly like the front with those pretty circles on it, and there's a little blue ribbon run through the beading. I think you know how much I enjoy searching around the world to get beautiful things to share with you here in my attic. Thank you so much for joining me in my sewing room today. I've had so much fun coming to your home, and I really want to invite you to come back next week. <laughs>